Hello and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is open to the public with in-person attendance in the city um, hall here at the council chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and can be watched remotely. Please note that public comment is available for in-person speakers only. Uh, the Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and remotely. There are several ways for the public to watch the meeting remotely. Information on how to watch the meeting via Zoom is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and also on the Planning Commission meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is Cable Class Live on Spectrum Communication, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Eric. Uh, please remember to turn off your cell phones uh, during the meeting. And just as a reminder, uh, our public comment period will be slightly different tonight in that public comments need to be in person rather than via Zoom. Uh, so with that, we will do a roll call. Commissioner Esty. Present. Commissioner Jensen. Present. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Vice Chair Christensen and Chair Westman. Here. Now we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so um, the next item on our agenda is new business. I don't think we have anything here. Uh, and then um, we'll move on to oral communications. And the first one is to uh, know if there's any additions or deletions to our agenda. We did have a few additional materials added to the agenda tonight. For item 5A, we added two emails. For item 6A, there was one email. And for general public comment, we received one flyer. All of these have been added to the agenda packet uh, and placed online as well. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, so now we're at our public comment time. And this item is for short communications from the public concerning matters not on the agenda. Uh, members of the public uh, may speak up to three minutes. Uh, individuals may not speak more than once during oral communications. And all speakers must address the entire legislative body. So is there anyone here for public comment? Good evening. Hi, my name is Juan Capich. Uh, today I am 10 a.m. I need a call to the CPD because the employee from McDonald's refused a petrol oven and a dollar bill so that he can pay for his food. I was asking what was happening, but he walked out and said that he doesn't understand what was going on because the money was not being accepted. I think it's a a little bit off when something like that happened. I have a lot of all the items, but I didn't have to for Biden. But I talked to the VA, the Veterans Affairs Office, and they listen very carefully because I'm a citizen, but I'm a, I have some rights. So, all I want to say, I think it's a little bit uh, a shame that something like that happens in Capicola and a business uh, refuses. Uh, uh, customer service, even if they have a hundred dollar bill in the hand. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you for your comments. Um, is there anyone else? Seeing no one, 
Uh, we'll move on to commission comments. I have a comment. Sure. So I was thinking about the fact that we are not accepting Zoom public comments anymore. I was at the, as you recommended it actually, I went to the city council meeting uh, where all the, the uh, disruption occurred. And uh, if, did a little research and found out that this, you know, this is not this is a widespread problem. It's not just Capitola. In fact, there was an article in the paper about the town of Atherton, where they had this and they decided that they would continue the Zoom meetings um, because they said, well, this was this was not a recurring problem. This was a, a one-time disruption. Uh, no sense changing policy on uh, on something that wasn't a recurring problem. Then it occurred to me a little further that maybe um, if the goal of, of these this, these people or this organization, or whoever they are, is to disrupt society or communities by limiting access to local government, I guess they succeeded because we're limiting access to local government by not allowing Zoom calls. So I think there's a good reason not to do Zoom. It's a, it's a big pain and it, half the time it doesn't work. But um, if we're not accepting Zoom calls because um, um, because of this type type of disruption, I think we should maybe think a little bit further on that. Thank you. It's my understanding that the city council is discussing this at their next meeting. Um, they're the ones that are going to make the policy decision for the city. Um, it was decided for us to not do it tonight since we were the first meeting after the incident happened at the council meeting. Uh, but what's going to happen in the future will be decided by the city council. That's their jurisdiction, not ours at their next meeting. Thank you. Zach. So, oh, so wow. <laughs> I can clarify a little more on that. So right now we are um, doing research on the matter at hand seeing if there's other techniques which would um, to ensure that there would be no disruptions. Um, but are, they won't be discussing it next, at next week's meeting. We think we're going to continue throughout this year to the end of 2023 with um, in-person comment only and research, see what other cities are doing, and then maybe in the new year come forward with a new methodology to allow um, possibly allow public participation via Zoom, and I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Uh, so we'll move on to staff comments. Yep, so um, one comment that I just wanted to bring up is next week at the City Council meeting, we will be, they'll be reviewing our general plan, our housing element. For adoption, so just want the public to know that, and that meeting starts at 6 p.m. on Thursday night. And then also, we have Kailash here who is going to give a quick update on Capitola Road, since we're so fortunate to have someone from Public Works this evening. Welcome to our Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Commissioners. I'm here uh, at the request of uh, Katie Hurley, our, our uh, Planning Department uh, Director, to give you a quick update on the status of our Capitol Road rehabilitation project that we did bring to you, I think, a, roughly a year ago now to, to review and approve. Um, that road project has begun with the sidewalk work being completed starting this week on the south side of the street. This project is from 41st Avenue, including the intersection there, through to city limits at 30th Avenue. Our city limits actually end halfway through that intersection and that's as far the county didn't want to partner so we stopped right there. And the sidewalk work is happening on the south side of the road and the sidewalk work on the north side of the road will be completed followed by paving and the paving will start um, as night work only to limit the amount of disruption to the community. Uh, paving will begin the week or the evenings in the week prior to Thanksgiving and then the full project should wrap up in the early part of December with final paving and final striping completed. So we're excited that this project has come to fruition and, and we were able to do the full project from 41st all the way to 30th. Thank you. So I have one question for you while you're here. 
Um, I noticed that they were doing some work around the Capitola Avenue bridge uh, that goes over the freeway. And um, it's my belief that um, we approved, uh, when we talked about the highway expansion, that that's going to be closed for a period of time. Do you know when they're planning on closing that bridge? I have a small update. I spoke last with the RTC who's running that project for the, the widening project that you're referencing that does require the replacement of the Capitol Avenue bridge. Um, my understanding right now is that they will be doing pretty extensive public outreach to uh, make sure that the community is aware of that closure upcoming and the detour that will be in place to allow those residents to still access those neighborhoods. I think their rough schedule is sometime in the spring that the, the bridge would be demoed with, and I don't remember, don't quote me on the duration, but I think they were anticipating something in the range of an eight to 10 month closure to do the full rebuild of that bridge. Um, but further outreach will come and the RTC will be engaging with our staff as well as our community to make sure everyone's aware of that. Thank you very much. I have a question as well, don't mind. Sure. Go ahead. So I'm trying to understand the Capitol Road. This is like on 41st Street. Where oh, Cap Ave. So over the freeway. Is that the right one? No, you started out talking about Capitol oh, Road, right? Sorry. And and so around 45th Avenue, where and the idea was we were updating the road and sidewalks and whatnot to accommodate an affordable housing. This is headed in the other direction from 41st Avenue, headed towards uh, the city of Santa Cruz, like towards oh. Live Oak. Okay. So well, but. Nevertheless, the affordable housing project is, and we we're going to do some sidewalk or some uh, changes there too. Is that moving forward? That project is moving forward. So we have building permits um, that are ready to be issued. They just need to come in and pay their fees. And there's two separate permits. One is to do work in the street and the other is for the development. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, while we have uh, Kailash here, thank you. Uh, can you give us an update on the wharf? Uh, yeah, so we've, we're about one month in on wharf construction. Uh, it's been a really kind of great experience starting with this new team that we hadn't worked with in the past. I feel like we've developed a good working relationship and the team is, I feel like, working very efficiently and smoothly. We are um, at schedule and definitely not behind schedule at all, a little bit advanced of what was originally provided to us. Uh, which is encouraging. And I would say that um, we've had a lot of support from PD as well as uh, all the different departments with the different questions that are coming in from the community, uh, engaging with the most immediately impacted residents there at the Venetian courts and the hotel right there. So I would say all in all, it's been a good start to a project and happy that it's underway. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, now we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Uh, we have two sets, October 5th and October 19th. Does anyone have any corrections or additions? I just have a, a comment. Sure. Uh, just about our October 19th uh, meeting. As I was reading through the minutes, I, it seemed like there was um, lots of emphasis put on some issues, um, like just myself, about the CEQA, you know, and how important that was. You know, I mean, it was noted, but I think there were, you know, I think I echoed some things that I felt very strong about. I know Commissioner Essendon did, I know each com commissioner, and I was just wondering, um, you know, if those can be, how those can be noted. Um, as you just read it, it says, you know, like, Commissioner Jensen noted concerns about the CEQA, and, it, um, and I think those, you know, I think overall, I think those, I think we all shared as much as we um, voted and supported the housing uh, element and everything. I'm just as those comments will be noted very clearly in the future so that when we reflect back in the future and we look at these projects that we can reflect back and say, well, the CEQA was a very important thing or the water concerns and other issues like that. And so it, it was, you know, so I think the timestamp of this commission was clearly noted that they supported it but had concerns that hope that they would be addressed in the future. And I, I should mention, um, in terms of minutes, we really depend on our video these days. So we try to keep the minutes more brief than you than we would have done 10 years ago because video is available and we can always go back and look at the videos. So you'll, you'll notice, I because I know that there's a lot of great comments that are made in this hearing, but to keep it 
um, succinct and we just, we really, we, as staff, we go back and look at the videos to see what was said a lot of the time, so. Thank you very much. Okay. So would you like to add something into the minutes? I think they were reflected, it's just, um, you know, I just think that, I think everybody had a very strong point of view and that I think that wanted to be carried forward. And so it was just, you know, I don't, I just don't know how that translates back to it. Obviously it was recorded correctly and I appreciate the, the work that was done. Um, it's just, I think it's important that, how could that be reflected back to um, when we look, you know, just using my issue as a sequel, that when it's another small project that comes forward um, and another project, you know, that when does that kick in a full EIR and stuff like that. So that's all my comment was. But I don't think I need to add anything in that. I appreciate that you, would, the staff would go back or our community go back to look at comments that were made to make sure that the next time things come up, that we can pull back in that there's a track record history that these comments were made and reflected forward. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Um, so would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes of October 5th and October 19th? Okay, we have a motion to approve. I'll second. And we have a second. So, um, we want to, we can just say all in favor. Aye. 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 It's carried unanimously. All right. Now we're going to move on to our public hearing. Uh, and this is a regional bike sharing permit. And we have a staff presentation. And we have a representative from the police department and public works department to help us if we have any questions. Yep. Thank you. And good evening, commissioners. Uh, this is the permitting end of the regional bike share program for your review this evening. And uh, as mentioned, we do have, uh, I'll get to my introductions, we have a, a lot of resources here for you to help with questions. Uh, we have a B-Cycle general manager, Kyle Klein. So Kyle's with us in selecting sites, and he's also working regionally at installation in the county and at UC Santa Cruz, and uh, can help us with any program-related uh, questions. We have Kalosh Zender, Public Works. Kalosh has done a lot of work in scouting sites, and uh, actually looking at pension clearances and, and kind of boots on the ground re review. And we have Officer Noah Sheeran, uh, who does outreach and education related to bicycles and e-bikes in the community, also on the enforcement end. Um, tonight's goals uh, is to certainly get input uh, from planning commission and the public. This is the first time uh, that this program is available for public comment, although uh, the initial motivations of this, uh, this program go back over five years. Uh, and I've got a slide deck for you to, to be reviewing various permits for 18 sites. And so we would like to have as many of those sites that achieve planning commission consensus to be approved tonight, uh, and then also identify sites that may need to explore alternatives or bring back some additional information for the commission. We're going to do that under cover of a permit amendment. Okay. Test, test. All right, so moving on, a little bit of background. I'm going to move through some of this. Uh, a little quickly, just because a lot of it is in the staff report, but uh, the initial direction from the city council for staff to initiate steps for this program uh, was a move made in 2018. Uh, there were some code amendments that uh, ended up enabling the city to engage with um, a, a bike share partner. Uh, there was also uh, an effort to collaborate regionally with other regulatory agencies and educational um, facilities uh, so that the the, uh, the only one vendor would be selected and the, the program would be universal. Uh, so with collaboration there, B-Cycle was the selected vendor. Uh, final agreements uh, with all of the entities uh, were struck in the last couple of years and we're at the point now uh, where we need to review actually sites for uh, when they're in the coastal zone, conditional development permits, and then where they're in the right of way. Uh, revocable encroachment permits. 
So a little few details about the contract is a five-year agreement with B-Cycle. Uh, this initial rollout, um, which actually means installing the, the, the bike docks, uh, is supposed to happen in March of 2024. Um, about the program, it's a little different than Jump Bike, which wasn't uh, totally a success. Uh, this is a dock-to-dock -dock system, so a user would take, take a bike from a dock and have to end their ride at a dock. Region-wide, the initial rollout, uh, 660 e-bikes with 1,320 docks. Capitola's share is 50 bikes with 100 docks, and there's an option to grow. Uh, and with that idea being after uh, ridership patterns and, and demand is understood, which will come after the program is initially rolled out. Uh, and then how would a user use it? Uh, they would typically need to be 18 years old uh, and demonstrate a credit card and go through the app. Uh, there are other ways um, to so that the program is not exclusive to those who are banked, um, but they would have to contact B-Cycle directly to do that. Um, here's just kind of a layout. I won't go through every way to pay, but um, if you use the program intermittently and for shorter duration, the, the price is uh, increased per minute. If you sign up for an annual membership, you get a cheaper rate and a longer duration. Um, the overall installation, uh, there's two different types and I'll get into some of the details, but the, the major two types are ballasted sites, which is a, just a gravity site set on uh, whatever surface that has weights in it, uh, so it's not permanently affixed to the ground. And then there are, are anchored sites, um, which can be moved, um, but are less ideal. Uh, to be moved. But both of these can be moved and adjusted in a, in a day's work. So there's a lot of flexibility built into uh, these sites. Um, regionally, the rollout uh, has started kind of west to east in terms of its uh, availability in the county. So uh, UCSC and the city of Santa Cruz has primarily completed their install and I believe they're into Live Oak now doing installations and then Capitola would be next in March of this year, um, B Cycle has uh, more than more than just Kyle. They have a fleet management team and maintenance teams uh, that routinely track bikes, recover bikes, redistribute bikes, uh, and these sites don't require any hard installation. So they have interchangeable batteries, and uh, they supply fresh batteries to the sites as well. So getting into what do these look like? So the upper left is. Uh, more or less an inverted U uh, type of installation, and this would be anchored into the gutter pan. And then in the middle on the top, that's a ballasted site. And so it's a, it's a steel platform with weights and a center track that the uh, inverted U uh, wheel receptacles are, are mounted to. And then uh, I'll point out the photo on the bottom left has uh, some orange delineators. So in, in places where we're doing a curbside installation uh, in the deck. I'll be showing you. There are some locations where we want to. We, we're not. We haven't selected orange. We'd rather white um, is our recommendation to use these, but to uh, provide a safety visual barrier uh, between traffic oncoming and the bike station. So here's a few more. And then this is uh, some installation details for the ballast. Um, this is just showing you clearances and the different types of installations. And then similarly, clearance details for the anchored type of installation. And we used uh, these details on the left, we used these to figure out uh, where to to actually locate a lot of these sites so that we'd have the appropriate back out distance, not be backing out into bike lanes or traffic lanes. And so a lot of this went into the planning and I'll, I'll, I cut a lot of these details into the individual sites. And so I'll be mentioning the type of install as we go. So with that, um, that is the background and this is our, our coverage map. And this was really, uh, I'd say the driver in terms of um, our initial rollout, we really wanted to, to have good coverage and not have any big blank spots on this map. Um, certainly we were mindful to have some concentration down toward the village, 
Um, but, but other than that, I think for the initial rollout, we did want a, a pretty good spread of coverage. Uh, the other thing to point out here is the on, along the left-hand side, we've got three uh, private properties in the in the shopping centers along 41st. And B-Cycle will be working independently, uh, trying to negotiate uh, to have the sites uh, cited on those properties. But we don't have total control of that, nor do we need to be permitting those sites, but we're, we're depending on that to fill in the, the west side of the map. So I'm about to get into the individual uh, slides for these sites, and I, I think it's probably appropriate for there's clarification questions for either me or our resources here. If the commission wants to, to offer those questions as we go, because it'll take a while to circle back through. But just a reminder, any um, deliberation or, or discussion really should be after the, the public comments. So clarification questions, uh, let me know as we go. I have one go ahead. right off the bat. You so uh, well, how long is the, um, is the permitting? Is it a year, two years, five years? How long these stations? How long are we committing to having these? Um, the contract is for five years, and the, the permitting would just be renewed with the contract. So this is a five-year commitment. Okay. There are a lot of safeguards built into that contract. Should anything go wrong with the program, there's there's ways in which to. Uh, the, say, yeah, I was thinking yeah, like, there, there's, there's a safety problem we wanted to pull out or the Yeah, so um, this the contract was as Brian said signed by um, Authorized for signature earlier in the year, but there's a lot of protections in that contract in which if we're having too many issues that we could um, okay. Remove ourselves from the contract so. Anyone else have a clarifying question? Uh, I have two quick ones so um, you're going to be able to rent one of these bikes even if you don't have their app on your phone. There's going to be a way to rent it at where the bikes are. Can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can rent with an RFID card. You'll have to contact us directly to get one of those, um, but I mail them out every Wednesday. Okay, but say I'm, I'm a visitor from out of town and I just mm. arrive in Capitola and I walk up to one of these stations and mm. I don't have your app on my phone. Um, and there's no way that I can then rent there, one of these bikes. No, there's no instantaneous way, but um, like I said, for anybody that's localized, we have RFID cards like these, um, which you can go up and tap on the docks and it rents the bike. Um, so that's a little bit of a more localized solution, um, but it is a potential. Okay. Uh, and I have one more quick question. We're being told that these go from one dock to the next dock. What right. happens if someone leaves a bike somewhere and doesn't take it to the next dock? Yeah. Um, so with that, there's a $75 fee if they're not returned, and then potentially you could be banned either temporarily or permanently from the system. Um, if you then create fake accounts, we can block your financial payments. I mean, we can go as far as necessary to remove members from the system to ensure the viability of the entirety of the system. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I, I have one other question. Um, is there any, um, like, assistance? In, it seems like this is really driven, you know, for people that live in the area. Mm -hmm. Social Center for Tours. Is there any um, uh, like assistance, financial assistance that you guys are providing to community members that might not be able to afford, uh, you know, whatever the fee is and stuff like that? So, is there a program that people that are in need or have financial constraints? Yeah. So, um, in our contract, there is no requirement for those programs, but locally, I am pushing those initiatives. So, I work with the Downtown Association in Santa Cruz. Um, the downtown street teams, the homeless gardens projects to provide them with discounted pass rates. Um, so we target low equity groups to help be inclusive. It's not a requirement, but um, it helps just build the program and it creates a face to the name of the product as well. So we're not just a bike, we're locals, we all live in the area and work here. I appreciate your efforts. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. 
Just to clarify, uh, Chair Westman's question, the, the stray bikes, you're going to come pick them up? Correct. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Is there, yeah. is there a time frame within which you're going to do that? Is that... Uh, yeah, so we chase what we would call chasing bikes which is a daily occurrence. So that's every morning we do that. Um, there's a very set of tasks we do, such as maintaining the bikes, monthly inspections, cleaning, checking stations, um, and collecting those bikes as well. Ideally, um, I don't want to get into this too much. I used to run jump bikes as well, so I have a lot of experience with that um, and chasing those bikes, which is a major issue with that system. Um, and that's something we just stay on top of here with B-Cycle. It's a really important factor just to make sure the streets are clean and they're not left in sidewalks and stuff. So, Thank you. Yeah. Are you During the program, will you go over the type of bike? Um, is that part of this? I mean, just, I think, as an overview, is it rated at 18 miles? Is it a 20-mile bike? Or? Yeah, so the bikes are governed to 17 miles per hour. It's a Class 1 e-bike. Um, so very standard, any of your main e-bike brands out there but yeah it's governed to 17 so now if you go downhill physics is going to take hold but for the purpose of a flat street you're going to be governed to 17 you're not going above it and i mean in our community we struggle i think right now and i think our police department is doing an amazing job with it but with you know you know, underage kids under the age 18 on e-bikes traveling at high rates of speed around and i know those bikes somewhere rated at a lot higher than this. But with you, the focus being for 18-year-olds or, or over, obviously Correct. many kids are going to be able to rent the bikes under that age. Um, I guess that's more of a question to PD, how they're going to work with trying to ensure that safety that we aren't just you know, adding to the problem or how we can you know, work. Yeah. I know they just introduced a helmet program and stuff like that, but I just was interested in the rate and the speed of the bike. So thanks for sharing that. Well, while you're up there and we're talking general terms that have you given consideration to figure out a way to provide helmets along with the bike so providing helmets there's a couple different issues there so you have a sanitary problem which is kind of an issue of its own but then you also have a viability issue of the helmet so let's say i rent a helmet take a spill and i don't tell anybody then you have a helmet that's went through an accident and somebody else could be using it so we tend to remove ourselves from that situation and instead being a truck company, we would we offer discounts on helmets. That's probably the way we would go with it instead of providing helmets as a whole because there's just multi-level layers of issues there that could occur. Yeah, figure. Okay. Yeah. All right, I've got one more since you're up. Of course. Of course. So <laughs> I talked to Brian about this. This is the surf rack question. Yeah. We've got a lot of uh, locations near beaches. One mm -hmm. of them is like near, right near O'Neill's, for example. Mm -hmm. So a lot of... A lot of guys on bikes, they have those little side racks that, you know, the board's right down next to them. Um, is there any thought of having some bikes like that? Because I would think those would be in high demand. Yeah. Um, actually, when I was working on the station locations here for Capitola and I was looking at, and it might have been the county, looking at Pleasure Point, I was thinking about that idea as having a bike rack adaptable for a, a surf rack. Potentially, we would offer selling those just at like a, a low rate so people could have access to them. I don't think we would put them on the bikes though because then you're introducing weight differentiations and that could potentially pose a safety hazard too. Um, so I, I don't think that's something we would necessarily add to the bikes but we could sell it as like an accessory that somebody could purchase somewhere like a helmet or something like that. So, you'd, so how would that work? So th these bikes, you own the bikes, right? Correct. So you would so it would be an accessory that they would be able to attach to the bike? Yeah, so you can get uh, surf racks that hook to your uh, stem, so your seat stem, like your saddle stem. So you could just sell that aftermarket. Put them on. Yeah. So that, that begs the question of, of the spacing. Mm -hmm. so, uh, would you have, when you have those um, uh, stations near the beach, would you have further spacing to allow for that kind of thing? Uh, I mean, we could, yeah, we could look at that. Um, I mean, the idea of a, a surf rack on a B cycle would just be an aftermarket option that would be purchasable by the consumer, and then they could just take it. Add well, I was just thinking if there were more, you know, like a, if three of those guys came up to the beach and then all of a sudden they're trying to get into that. Yeah. You know, then now it's tight. All right. Well, we've never ran into this, but we are welcome to uh, 
to face the challenge and create a solution. Just thinking. <laughs> yeah, no, I like the idea. Out there, I so. love the idea. <laughs> That's it. Okay. I'll let Brian continue. All right. And after we'll, the presentation, we'll open the public hearing. We'll start with site number one. So this is in front of O'Neill's on Melton Street. Uh, there's a extended red curb. And this has been scouted for a 14-foot installation. Uh, this would need to be angled uh, so as not to get out into the traffic lane with the back out requirement. We need to stay clear of the fire hydrant. And the plan is for delineators at the on oncoming side and six docks anchored. Site two is the north side of Claire's. Uh, that we again have a red curb installation. Uh, this street, the curb to curb width is, is significantly wider than uh, some of the uh, less traveled streets. So we actually can just back straight out at this location. Uh, delineators are recommended here as well. And we would have six docks in this location. Question on that site. So you've got this one and several others that have, you're using red curb locations I, I mean the reason for the red curbs are you don't want just cars there I assume that there's some some danger I mean like that one particularly has a power pole right next to it I mean is there any safety concern about just you know taking over or accommodating these uh, red curb areas I mean perhaps we should let Public Works or the police answer that question? Uh, yeah, good question. The the uh, selection of the red curb areas here, these are primarily, primarily areas where red curbs are installed for sight distance and having it not be a full-sized vehicle like a, you know, Tahoe or Sierra parked there, you'd still be able to see as a driver coming out of that driveway, you're, you're not going to have a, a block of your vision to come out from a safety perspective. So that's the main reason why the red curb areas that we selected kind of fall into that category. That explains it. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to wait for our comments. Like, uh, should we just make notes as we go through them or you want to? How do you want to recommend? I, I think we probably want to comment on each site as we go through it. Does that work for you, Brian? Yeah, that work that works for me. I, I think it's in open so you know, we just ask questions. Well, wherever you feel is best. You're, you're correct. We should. We'll just make notes and we'll come back after. If you'd like, I mean, you could open the public hearing now to hear the public comments, and then as you go through them. Whatever. Okay. So then you can work through each one. Sure. We can do it. Is that acceptable? Okay. Uh, so with that, we're going to open the public hearing and hear from the public. Uh, if you have any comments about this application before we make all, we make too many comments. Sign in, please. And you have three minutes. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Neil Savage. I live up in the drill box. I'm very much looking forward to the e-bike rentals. I think it's fabulous that we're working across the county so I can go from one end to the other on an e-bike. I commute into Midtown three days a week. I should cut that down to zero with an e-bike. Um, I'm here actually to talk about being cautious about what you put into the village. Right now in the village, there's too many pedestrians, too much congestion, and I think it'll be a mistake <clears throat> to have sites 12 and 13 in the village. And I think it'd be smarter to move them into the parking lots. Already bikes that come down cliff are coming into the village at high speeds and are a hazard to the pedestrians walking into the village, adding inexperienced riders at high speeds. We heard about gravity there. On heavy bikes, e-bikes are very heavy compared to a regular bicycle. I think it's not a good idea. I think my recommendation to, to the commissioner would be to start out slow, to see how it goes, and be conscientious about adding bike stations in the village. 
I think they should be on the peripheral of the village instead. Like I said, it's already can be a mess on, on popular days. And I'm guessing from experience, once we have experience, I think within five years you'll find yourself looking at keeping e-bikes out of the village at all, because I think we'll find that they're dangerous like we have found with skateboards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. Anyone else would like to address us? Good evening. I'm Paula Bradley, a resident of Capitola and a cyclist. And I'm really excited about the B-Cycle program. Um, the more cycles we see, the more E-Cycles we see, even though they are sometimes driving a little too fast and hazardous, it means less vehicles on the roads. So that's a really positive thing for the village and just about everywhere else. So. Anything we can do to get more people on bikes safely is a positive. So I'm excited about the project. Um, I did go and look at some of the site, the locations and had a few questions. Um, so far for one and two were my main questions about those locations um, or by O'Neill's on Milton. Um, but I think the presentation uh, answered my question. The street address used was confusing, uh, the same as it was for Claire's. But now that I see the locations, it makes sense. Um, one of my questions, though, is I'm a little out of date, but whatever happened to the trends at center at the mall, is that gone? Are there buses that drive over there and a need to have some bike stations nearby? Uh, well, the Mall Transit Center is, is still there. Uh, they're still operating buses out of it. Um, and as uh, was shown on the map, it's anticipated that there will be some stations, docks on the mall property. But that's private property, so that will be reached with an agreement between um, the bike people and the owners of the mall but it is anticipated that they will be located there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ho hopefully that's in the works. But yeah, it looks like that's the only location that's private property, so I can see right. that. There were actually three of them, where Brown Ranch Marketplace is, uh, the mall itself, and King's Plaza, where um, outdoor, no, can, I was gonna say. Supply hardware. Uh, uh, but at the King's Plaza Center. Okay, and I think this is could probably wait to the end for the representative of B-Cycle, but I'm wondering how is it going so far out there with the university in Santa Cruz? Okay, we'll ask him that question. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, seeing no one will close the public hearing. And so we'll go back and see if Anybody has any comments about site one on the planning commission and move our way through the various sites? Does that work? Okay. Any questions on site one? I don't think so. Or two. All right. I think we were on beginning three. All right. So three is 45th Avenue. And uh, again, we have a, a good curb to curb distance, so we can uh, do a 90 degree perpendicular install along the curb on the west side. Uh, the only real consideration here is there's a cluster of utility boxes, so we'll, we'll stay clear of those. And this is anticipated for six docks. Uh, I'll that. stop for questions on this one. Yeah. So. Um, I went down there and took, I took a look at all of these, and I have, sorry, I have questions on most of them. Um, I on this one, I was wondering about the, the parallel parking. So there's, there's parallel, you're taking a, a spots that cars would currently park, park in, and then there's spaces all the way down to the edge of 41st and Capitola Road. So I was wondering, as you uh, mapped out this particular location, did you like measure the, the distances between between the, at the edge and, and the end of the street to see, uh, you know, are you cutting out half a car space or would cars fit there nice and, 
neatly or, you know, if you moved it in a foot, oh, yeah, then you could squeeze another car in there or in terms of, you know, what extent was parking, parallel parking of cars considered in selecting that exact space? Yeah, I think on, on some of the sites we did look at those kinds of things. We looked at uh, right turn queuing. This one, the, the primary concern was the utility boxes. But <coughs> I, I think the intention here with just the adaptability of the program is that there prob there's more than likely going to be some site adjustments that are made. So if, if the suggestion from the commission is to to round off to maintain the maximum amount of parking, I think we can we can build that into the installation instructions for all sites. Yes, that's my comment. Okay. All right, site four is the parking lot at Jade Street Community Center. So there's a, a bit of a reserve curbed paving space to the right side of the one-way entry drive aisle uh, that is red curbed um, for not fire access purposes, not emergency purposes, really just to not have vehicles parking there and potentially block the drive aisle. So we had a, a space we could use here, uh, and these would be a ballasted perpendicular six docks at this location. Questions on that one? And number five is across from the library at the park at Rispin. So there's uh, some space in between the, the poured stair and ramp. Uh, and this would also be a ballasted install. Uh, we will verify that there's, that it, there's no blockage of the path. Uh, that was the main concern with this site. Other than that, it has, has good length for up to eight docks. So on that one, if there is blockage, you would uh, you would adjust the would you adjust the path? I mean, would they adjust the path to go around that since it's such a great spot to put it? Or how would those be addressed? Or would it be less bikes? Or yeah, it, it, the, the other option would be to move it to the other side of the path. There's also a lot of space there. And being that it's ballasted, it could adapt to the eventual development of the park. So that, that's why this one wanted to be ballasted. It's, there's, there's a couple of options to be flexible on this one. Yeah. We'd like it to work here, though. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a great spot. I have a question about um, vandalism. Some of these spots are kind of tucked away in little you know, out of the way spots that were, you know, it's just great because they don't interfere with any traffic or foot traffic or anything. But then it, 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 the question becomes is, you know, I mean, you already have this established in other communities. I was wondering if vandalism is a problem. How, just how sturdy are these stations? I don't know, maybe it's a... Kyle? Uh, yeah, there's a, a potential for vandalism for any of the stations. Um, this site, that was kind of in my mind a little bit as well, but I'd be kind of surprised if we saw a lot of that there. The ballasted racks are almost impossible to damage, to be honest. Um, the, the dock itself could be damaged, but you'd really have to put a lot of time into it. Um, we don't see a whole lot of individuals like vandalizing the racks themselves. Typically it's like theft of parts on the bikes. That's the most popular. So less so the docks. I, I personally wouldn't be too worried about this spot, though. But in, in, well, any of the spots. I mean, you've looked at them all. Yeah, any anywhere. I mean, it. What I've learned about bike share over the years is that regardless of where you put any of this stuff, there is a potential of vandalism. Um, if somebody has malintent, they're going to seek stuff out and damage and vandalize it. I mean, we see it in all of our cities across the country already it is so. But in terms of site selection, you wouldn't use that as a consideration? Like, oh, this is a, you know. Well, generally for this area, this was the best location that I was able to scout out and locate that I thought was safest, both from a vandalism, theft, damage perspective, chance of hitting, um, people accessing the bikes. I mean, you have the nice bike path right there. 
I think it just generally it's a good spot. Um, now, that being said, if we do have a lot of vandalism or something there, um, you know, I would work with our city counterparts here to relocate it or to find a new place to move it to. Actually, the word that occurred to me was I, when I was looking at the one in New, near New Brighton, um, it just seemed to be kind of all by itself. And, and I thought, well, if there was any that, you know, we would want to eliminate because of vandalism or something at wouldn't be this one it would be yeah. that one but but uh, you know i just brought the question up in general i mean you've had this already installed is it this hasn't been a problem uh it depends it depends on what area you're in um and we have certain parts of santa cruz that we have issues with but the way that i go about it is actually working with our community so that's what actually poised me to start working with downtown street team the homeless gardens project um we have other B-cycle programs around the country that have had a lot of success working with their communities and ingraining themselves within it versus um, not putting a face to the name of the product. My, my whole concept is making the belief that these are our bikes and not their bikes is my whole kind of motive towards all this, so. Okay, thanks. Yeah. For this site, I will mention that we we did look at the library as another option, but because of the topography around the library um, and overcrowding, we decided it was not a good location for it and the access in and out of the library. So, and that wall will probably be cut down if once the Rispin projects start anyways. At that wall, right? Yep, the Rispin the wall will be lowered, so it will become more visible over time. So hopefully that will help. All right, we'll move to the site six. So this is the bus stop in, in front of a, a parking lot that's used by Shadowbrook. And uh, this one has one of the alternate installation types. These are, um, they back up toward each other in this uh, rectangle that we've shown here. And that's because we didn't want to block any of the pedestrian walkways here or uh, get too close to the curb at the, the bus stop. And this would be for four docks. These would be anchored. And then the little diagram with the face-to-face -face back out, or face out and backing toward each other access. Any questions? All right, number seven is at the, it's kind of a dead end. It's where 49th and Prospect um, Kind of wrap around and turn into each other. Uh, this is in a no parking striped area along a curb. Plenty of space here uh, for an anchored installation and eight docks. Question. Okay. Number eight is along Cliff Drive. Uh, there is an angled painted bit of uh, uh, asphalt next to some paid parking. A um, little bit cramped in just this angular space that's the remainder. Um, so we were only able to fit four docks in here uh, and this would be a ballasted site. On that location there, um, isn't some of that right now cordoned off a little bit uh, for the, the for parking from this, the standpoint of um, what the condition of the cliff is at this time? That's further down the street, uh, closer to the village. So this is the higher up of the parking areas that are along the bluff. So um, I, I have a question um, for us. Uh, we did get a comment from the public about the spaces in Capitola Village and suggesting that perhaps the parking for the bikes should be more on the edge of the village. And it seems like if we were going to do something like, consider something like that, it, we would need to have a lot more parking spaces on the edge of the village. And I just wanted to get a little consensus. Do you have concerns about? I, I don't think we should limit. I think, I, think, I mean, I, I appreciate the concern and I understand the concern. I think that um, having centrally located docks is important, more important than um, 
the congested problems. I think that have, being able to transport the bike into the village, dock it, go to work if you work in the village, or go home if you live in the village is more important driving, you know, putting the responsibility on those individuals to be careful. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the concern about, you know, e-bikes hurling down Cliff Drive in Monterey, but I'd rather have an e-bike than a uh, F-150 or a, yeah. a Tundra. And I, I'm... I think we should flood the village with these things and get the cars out of the village, personally. Agreed. <laughs> I, I tend to agree, although, again, I, I appreciate the comment. And um, as I was walking up to this site, you know, the, there were some guys on bicycle, regular bicycles hurling down there 40 miles an hour. Um, and, and, yeah, I was glad they were lightweight bikes and not e-bikes, which are probably much heavier. So I appreciate the concern, but... Um, but yeah, I, I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, so I, I would tend to be in favor of village parking. Okay. I had actually an additional question. Um, if people are, I guess this is for the <laughs> representative, I'm sorry, I keep making it stand up and sit down, but um, just out of curiosity, I was looking through your website and just the frequently asked questions, and it says that there's... Um, 30 minutes is the allotment of time from when you check the bike out to when you redock it. And then it's additional costs for every additional 30 minutes. Is that so right? it depends. If you do the, the single pass, you get a, a single allotment of 30 minutes. If you do a monthly or an annual, the monthly 30 minutes or the annual 60 minutes, you can do that as many times as you want. It's, it's uh, more of a ceiling than an allotted time. So each time you rent, whether it's 50 times in a day or once in a day, each trip can go up to 30 minutes or up to 60 minutes. And then once you go past that threshold, that's when you would pay the additional $3 for 30 minutes. Um, I'm just curious with these smaller sites that are in populated areas, are you running into any, um, say, if you took a bike from Santa Cruz mm. up or clear over to Capitola to go to work, say, or whatever. Yeah. And you find that some of these smaller docking sites are full, that bike then, I mean, would you, how do you remedy that? Yeah. So that does occasionally happen. Typically we'll see it on campus just with it being so busy. Um, unfortunately we don't have alternative options to docking the bikes. Mm -hmm. Um, customers have abandoned bikes, but they receive $75 charge each day. It's not returned. We then each day, find the bike and return it typically. Um, the way I look at that is we determine the size of the stations to launch, and then demand is what really informs our next decision of where do we add more docks? Maybe this station doesn't work great. Maybe this spot would be better. You know, okay. If that helps explain that. Um, is there any... I mean, is there a number people can call so it's not like a yeah. oh, five dollar charge? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Each bike, has, and this is a requirement in the state of California, you have to have a Braille decal with your customer service number on it. Um, and so on each bike on the shroud, there's a Braille 1 800 number. You can contact that, they can help you out. And they can just, you can let them know that you didn't have a docking state. Okay. I just, just yeah, you are supposed to return it to a dock though. So, Ideally, there would be a close enough location that you could then go to that instead. Um, which leads me to my next question, <laughs> um, just so you don't have to sit back down. Yeah. But the, um, if you, if, if as this program progresses over the next five years, mm -hmm. or I think, did you, I don't know if you've already mentioned this, and apologize if you have to repeat yourself, but um, for additional locations is that going to be an addendum to this permit did you already say that no no if we so there is some flexibility built in here but if we were to add a whole new site that was never contemplated we would need to amend this permit okay so just individually it would come back to planning commission and then we'd okay that's all thank you <laughs> i appreciate it i have a question i want to elaborate on that just a little more can you go to the last slide to site seven so this site here there's plenty of room for more than the proposed eight parking spaces. So if there was a great demand or we needed more docks near the village, within the permit that you're issuing tonight, uh, staff would like the flexibility in the areas that it's safe, it's not impacting other parking spaces, that we could go ahead 
and allow more bicycle parking spaces. But the, and then if we go to slide eight, this this is really limited. Like we can't, we couldn't add more uh, bicycle parking spaces there. But the locations themselves are what, what will be approved this evening. And then as we figure out demand, we'll work with Kyle to be able to work within the sites that are approved um, to accommodate the demand. But just more, but anytime there's a brand new site, like Brian said, we would come back to Planning Commission. So a little bit of flexibility within the approvals. I have a question on this site. So why this far up the hill? Why not right down at the top of the stairs, which is where I thought this was, was where Jerry thought this was initially, and I did too before I walked further up. Um, that would obviously be a better spot in terms of accessing the bikes. We'd lose, was it because you'd lose parking spaces? You were to put bikes there. Which space are you? So it, 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 right at the t top the of the, the 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 wooden stairs. Mm -hmm. So that's you know that that out, looks very much like this one, but it's further down. Kailash. <laughs> we knew we'd need the whole team tonight. Uh, again, good question. Uh, we did look at that. So. I think to just Jerry's first question about the area that's currently cordoned off due to safety concerns at the second. So we have, there's two parking locations that face the ocean on Cliff Drive. This is the upper of the two. The one that's lower down has the access to Hooper's stairway. And then on the uphill side has the area that's blocked off currently to uh, pedestrian access due to safety concerns. And so we did not so we I think in an ideal situation we would have selected that corner but for safety reasons we picked this corner up the next closest corner that we could find and then the reason not to put it right there at the top of the stairs is there is a sidewalk that goes to the stairs and in order to if we were to try to fit uh, cycles in that location we'd either have to take away a parking spot or have a conflict with the pedestrian access to the top of that stairway ramp so you're taking parking spots elsewhere in the city why why are those so sacred uh, so maybe brian might be able to elaborate more but in general we tried not to take especially paid parking spots off of the street and so this was <laughs> one of those considerations paid for, i get it <laughs> ask one more question Kailash. if um are we is there any projections to put them on the wharf after it's all finished in 2024 yeah, uh, we had, we've talked about that. It seems like a good idea. I think it would, it would, yeah, once we're there and we see use, I think that would be something that would be a, a nice amenity to add. Thank you. Okay, are we done with eight? Okay, we'll move on to nine. Nine is at along Hill Street at the Bay Avenue intersection. This is uh, at the, in front of Dairy Queen. And so we've identified this site for five docks anchored and with delineators. This is at a right turn. And so we would want delineators on the uh, oncoming traffic side. So yeah, and same question on, that I had on 45th Street. This one, you can actually see the cars parked there, so. Uh, when you when you do actually select that delineation, you know, can kind of con consider how many cars can fit between the there and then in the in the driveway, like the curb cut. So, yeah, there is a stretch of red curb here. We, we were ideally going to use oh, right. use oh, that. Oh, it's only red curb. Okay. Yeah, and maximize the distance from the crosswalk. All right. <laughs> And so this is across from Gales at uh, the intersection of Bay and Capitola Avenue. And so this is across the street and there's a partial red curb. You would lose about a half of a parking space with this one. Um, it would need to be angled, uh, steer clear of the storm drain inlet, of course. And we've identified this one for six docks and would certainly need delineators. It's a pretty bu busy spot. So there's a curb cut on, on that curb. Is that is there a right-of-way to the village, uh, the Capitola Produce 
that they have access to that lot or something because that there is a curb cut there and I don't know what the history of that is. Left over from when it was a gas station. Okay. <laughs> so so there's no uh there's no. there's there's no reason to keep that car or to no, take it over or whatever. Okay. It was just left over from when there used to be a gas station on that corner. Brian, I, a question on this location. Um, <clears throat> with the talk of a roundabout that, the, and I've heard talk that it can be something that with the PG&E grant funding that might be coming in place as early as this next summer during off school time. Um, and there's this program coming into play in March. Is that something that you guys are going to look at and that maybe this would be adjusted before it you know, got put in and then got, had to get moved a couple months later? Yeah, I, I, I think the disruption of this area would be so significant that we would we would have a, a look at what that would be. Um, I would imagine that the, all the paving would be new as well. So we were less concerned about, about drilling into this if it was entirely uh, under the cover of a, a capital improvement project. So uh, I think the, the short answer is yes, this could be moved to accommodate. So it might be put in in March, but then... If that project was going to start in June, it would just be relocated at that time? That's right. Okay. All right. Site 11 is City Hall. So behind uh, the chambers here, we have a, a parking space that uh, would be repurposed between the dumpster and the building. And uh, the one concern about this one was uh, the docks need a, a cell connectivity and uh, it did pass the signal test. So this is a, a viable site. Any questions? No. All right, so now we are into the proper village uh, with 12. This is at the corner of San Jose and Esplanade. Uh, there's a strip of, of red curb at this location. Uh, and so but it's not, uh, there's not a lot of remainder space here, so we've only cited four docks in this location. Uh, also, the, the police tend to stage in this location, so we would work with them uh, in order not to disrupt uh, their activity. But that was the, uh, the only real consideration. Other than that, it's a pretty central location and could accommodate four docks. So I was wondering on this one if it made some sense to move it a little further back from the corner uh, since there is a fairly large area with red curb there that's not being used. Um, so it's uh, not quite so close to the corner itself. Are you trying to preserve, preserve enough room for the police to still be able to park behind the bikes? I believe that was the reason for that is because they oftentimes will just park there while they're down in the village. So it was to preserve space for the police. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought about the new law that's just going into place with the viewing standpoints for cars on these corners? It's, it has to be uninstructed, I think, right? It, would this not count because it, it, this, this uh, of bikes, would that be not uninstructed in those areas? Brian, do you want me to give an update on AB 413? Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. Um, so a new law just came, just passed, AB 413, and it requires that cities not allow parking within 20 feet of a crosswalk. So this would comply with that standard. You are allowed to uh, have bicycle parking within that the 20 feet area, um, and but our police probably shouldn't park in the red zone. I don't, I don't know. That's a different area. I'm not really sure what the rules are for police and parking, but um, sure, if you want. But th but this would, but Capitola will be having to look at our different intersections and our setbacks from uh, crosswalks, and that was passed in order to protect bicyclists and um, pedestrians. So, so it's just for vehicles parked there. Is what you said? Uh, bike parking is fine. Bike parking is fine. There's an exception for. Uh, Bicycles and scooters. Can motorcycles park there? I do not think so. I was just going to second that. I would have to do a little bit more research on that new law. But, I mean, typically we have used that as a staging area. 
uh, for foot patrols or events down there, um, just because it is a convenient central location. Um, but with that law update, I would assume it would be only responding to an emergency that we would put patrol cars there. But that's something we'd have to look at. Thank you. I've got a question. Since since we're downtown, it's more of a general question. Um, since um, you're going to be looking at private property in Browns Ranch and 41st Street, have you looked at Quality Market? That's down. That's right down there in the village, and uh, they might they might really relish the notion of having access. Um, so, Kyle, this is at the corner of the intersection, right as you go down the street here, where um, Stockton and Capitol Avenue meet. It's a little grocery, little grocery convenience store. store. Market. Um, I haven't. No, this is just really an initial kind of location. Uh, determination right now, but I can definitely add that to potential locations we could look at. Yeah, I recommend you at least contact them. I, it might be a win-win. Yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, since you're up, there's. <laughs> um, no means. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump ahead to the to number seventeen, which is Capitola Knowles. You're taking up uh, uh, parking space there, but there's a lot of there's a big berm. As I assume it's part of Capitol Knoll's property, and I was just wondering if, if you could negotiate with them to actually put it on their property as opposed to on the street. There's a potential for it, yeah. I could look yeah, just it. a thought. We we wouldn't lose a spot, parking spot, and they would probably appreciate, you know, donate. They they might want to donate that land just so they can have e-bikes close to their, you know, their village. Yeah, yeah we can look at that. Do you have much um, resistance from private property owners when you approach them? It's a mix. Um, it's ultimately always easier to work with local government groups. Um, sometimes as well, there's um, the belief that there's a lot of profit in this industry. Um, I can easily dispel that. Bike share is uh, a very low revenue generating industry, if generating at all. Um, so we do sometimes get pushback with private where it's like, I require X revenue. Um, typically though, we actually do the opposite and we request payment to put docks on land um, when it's on private property. So r right now I haven't went too far down that road. Um, I'd prefer just to work with my local groups here. Um, it's just a little bit easier that way. Um, but I do have a couple private locations in the Santa Cruz area that we've worked on. So. It just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Site 13 is Esplanade Park. So this would be adjacent to the restrooms. There's an existing bike, proper bike rack here. So that would get relocated. And uh, we, would, we would target six docks for this location. You check to see if you have enough clearance to the shower that's right there on the lower right of that picture. Because you know, look at the guys and gals show up with surfboards and pull them around in that shower. I don't want to hit your bikes. Yeah, the spray line you can kind of see in this this photo. It's it may require you to cut it from six to four. Or something like that. Right. There seems to be room to just move it further down, closer towards the green sign. I mean, there's. Um, there's a curb there, and then it goes right into the entrance to the bathroom. So. Not on that um, side. On the so, side is a restaurant. That might be private property. Well, all I know is currently it's just filled with empty bike racks that they're restoring there. So there's, there's stuff there. Yeah. Anyway, just so this general area here, it's between Britannia Arms, and it's to the the left. When you're looking at the men's bathroom, it'd be the to the left. So. Um, there is, there's a large planter to the left of this that's pretty high and it goes away as along that building. I do think this is a great opportunity spot for a mix of not only B-cycle, but for the kids' bikes during the summer and visitors' bikes. So it's something that there's a tree there. I think it's an idea. It's an area that the city is going to be looking at as we start looking at Esplanade Park. Um, but this would be the, the first step, but really, um, if you ever, next time you're down there, take a look at this area because it really has a lot of potential for becoming something with 
really special, I think. It's kind of a hidden treasure in Capitola. So there's plans to use those bicycle racks. <laughs> Yeah, I think it, I think it could be. There's a design fix to what's happening in that little area that we could accommodate a lot more bicycles, um, including be, uh, shared shared bikes as well as private bicycles. So, yeah. all right, fourteen is uh, on the uphill side of the parking lot. Uh, there's a. This is actually a bit wider than the photo does justice for. This is about a 10 or 11 feet wide strip of mulch. And the idea here is uh, ballasted plates would sit on the mulch. And uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of room here for at least eight, eight docked locations. Any questions? Okay. All right, Monterey Park. Uh, so the detail on this one where we've we forecasted four docks for this location. Um, Public Works uh, separately is working with PG&E. Uh, there's a, a gas, gas line that runs underground at this location. And PG&E is looking to install a regulator valve and pour a few concrete pads. Uh, so one thing that, that uh, Kailash is working out is to potentially have an additional pad located here that would help accommodate the bike uh, installation. But it would be it would be on park property exclusively. Any questions? All right, number sixteen, uh, Kennedy Drive and Monterey Avenue. Uh, we we're looking to put four docks at curbside here with delineators. Our siting notes were to stay fifty feet behind the stop strike. There's some uh, heavy heavier vehicles and trucks that come in and out of this street. And queuing for a right-hand turn, we wanted to maintain a bit of clearance there. Um, but the general note that we want to minimize parking loss also means we'll, we'll put together um, something that makes sense to not cut parking spaces in half uh, to the extent we can between the curb and uh, the church's curb cut. That's how I would look at that here, is to maintain the, as many parking spaces as possible. Any questions on this one? All right, 17, so uh, this is the one we just talked about. So uh, this one was was uh, targeted for four docks uh, at the far side of the Sir Francis intersection with Kennedy. Uh, I've got the note that um, we, we may see about private property cooperation and locating it on the Knowles property, but uh, again, we'd follow the same direction and, and try to make the uh, spacing breaks between uh, parking spaces and the docks work out. My concern there was that this, when I'm looking at this spot, it seems to be there specifically to service Capitola Knowles. I mean, that's a huge apartment complex, You're taking up a parking space in order to have a docking station for them. So, you know, I would think that they would be willing to put it on their property, save that spot. Isn't there? Uh, isn't there a crosswalk that serves right there too? And so it might just be an option too if we're going to lose parking in the city because of the twenty foot, at close, you know, as we approach the intersection or to a crosswalk, it might be it might be something to look at too. I thought there was a crosswalk. There's not an actual. I don't think. Kailash, I know we we spoke a little bit earlier today about a crosswalk in this area. If you could elaborate. Yeah. So I think uh, as as Dr. Hurley pointed out, with that. AB 413. 413. Um, because there is a stop sign right there, we could then, this could be shifted to go into that zone that we no longer will be allowed to accommodate parking and then just switch that on street parking spot to a bicycle parking spot. So, in a sense, we're being forced to take one parking spot off the street, but then we can add uh, four more bicycle parking spots. So, hopefully, the, the net is still usable for that the section of the community. That's a good answer. Okay. The last one, uh, Coronado Street, Park Avenue corner. Our citing notes is to, again, avoid a right-hand tur 
turn queuing potential, so uh, 30 feet behind the stop stripe minimum, uh, which would put it just in front of the, the garden wall and uh, shrubs that you see in the photo. And this is targeted for six angled docks. So, so this the picture doesn't, I don't think, show justice to the uh, steepness of the hill there. What, what's your experience with putting these things on a hill? Does it make it hard for first-timers to start up? Uh, no, having them on a hill shouldn't have any impact. Just generally speaking, we have a handful of them on UCSC campus that have some degree of incline or decline to them. So as long as we're putting them in a, a good angle and the base is not offset or anything, um, regardless if it's angled anyway, like should go and fine. Actually, what could cause issues would just be like compression, but that would never happen on like an incline or decline. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Just before you sit down, sorry, um, just of course. outside of Capitola, but um, looking, you know, to the uh, New Brighton Beach area, mm -hmm. it just seems like that'd be a great destination. Is, are there plans that they're going to be there too? Cause obviously, Capitola ends here, but just looking at the overall map, it looks like that'd be the next place somebody would ride to. Yeah, yeah, so that likely would fall under the county's Aptos area, I would have to assume. Maybe we would put it in with the SoCal area. I'm not really sure. I haven't got to that level of planning yet. Um, right now I'm working on Live Oak Twin Lake area with the county and Capitola, um, and then it'll be Watsonville, and then the remainder of the county will be rolled out after. Thank you. So I, I have a question about, so... Um, you need a credit card to rent these, and you know you have to be over eighteen to rent them. Mm -hmm. but someone over eighteen can rent them for a child under eighteen. I mean, <laughs> yes, but any that could be related to anything, though. If I mean, you could relate that to drugs and alcohol too. At that point. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the program. So if um, if someone under 18, I guess there's no law about you have to be a certain age to ride an e-bike. Correct. Uh, perhaps. Oh, you have to. <laughs> so there are a couple different applicable laws to this. Um, there's a big one coming down the pipes with uh, the legislature is looking at establishing a driver's license program, um, requiring anybody under 18 to have a certain class of driver's license. That's not currently in effect. Mm -hmm. um, the other laws that would apply to this with juveniles on e-bikes would be anybody under 18 is required to wear a helmet, of course, as well as the different classes. So it sounds like these are class ones. So juveniles aren't allowed to ride class ones, um, but if the company has specific rules against it, then obviously that would be on the person um, per temporarily renting that, that e-bike. Um, so there may be some changes to this down the road. I hope that kind of clears it up. Right. So if I'm a family who arrives and uh, I've got two kids, mm -hmm. they're 12 and 14, uh, we could rent four bikes as long as we brought helmets for our kids to wear when they're riding those bikes. It would de Legally, they would probably be okay right now. It would depend on the company's policy mm -hmm. on the person being allowed to ride that bike. Um, if you're talking about like enforcement action that we would take but from you. Yeah. I mean, if, if they're, they would legally be riding a class one e-bike and as long as they're wearing a helmet and following the other rules of the road, we would not have as much of an issue with that. But again, if they're violating the company's policy, it could be a, a tricky situation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And just to take this conversation, sorry, it's just kind of going a little bit, but just to take an opportunity just to refresh our community again, can you just go over it? So, under 18, and then how, like, two kids riding a bike and yeah. they have the, the applicable laws and stuff. Can you just take the opportunity just to notice for safety? Of course. So uh, I'll start with the two kids on the bike. So uh, the vehicle code's pretty clear on that is not okay unless the bike is designed uh, to have more than one person on it. Um, in that case, it's required to have both uh, pegs for the, the rider's feet as well as a seat. Obviously, the rider would have to be wearing a helmet as well. Um, so there are some e-bikes out there. I'm not super familiar with B-Cycles model that they'll be providing if they'll have seats or if that's an option. Um, but that is something that many e-bikes do have. Um, and you could have potentially one uh, additional rider on it. Obviously, 
four people on one bike is typically not legal or safe. Um, so that I think answers that part for the second part. Do you mind refreshing me? Like, so a helmet's mandatory for yes. under, 18. under 18. They're required to wear a helmet right now. Over 18, they are required to wear a helmet. Um, everybody's required to legally wear a helmet for class three e-bikes. If these are class ones or even twos, then that would not be required for adults. Obviously the company may have policies or recommendations and I believe B-Cycle on their website does, you know, recommend wear a helmet and then obviously following all the other traffic laws. And not to get technical, but like on a class three, that's like a 29 miles an hour, right? So uh, that, uh, 28, yeah. 28, sorry. Uh, it cannot go in a bike lane or it can? So no, so class threes can go in a bike lane. So just to break it down, ones and twos are pedal assist only. Um, and those can typically go up to uh, 20 miles an hour or so. The class three is up to 28 legally, and they all three can go in bike lanes. The main difference between two and three is threes, uh, you don't technically need to pedal to accelerate. Um, so if you're out and about in public and you see somebody on an e-bike, what looks to be an e-bike, and you see them start zipping and their feet aren't moving, it's probably a class three. And then the other big change with threes is there are certain areas that cities can establish um, that they're not allowed to ride in. So the good example for Capitola would be the River, Riverview Pathway. Uh, class threes are not allowed in that uh, area. And there's other um, like off, off-road off areas that are not bike lanes, but that may be um, other pathways such as the Rispin Mansion, where if a city decides to establish rules on that, they're not allowed in that area. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So when we're asking, I have one more question. Yeah. So no one can ride a bike on the sidewalk in the village. Are children still allowed to ride, even if it's an e-bike on the sidewalk? So the municipal code does allow for kids under 10 years old to ride in the village, or excuse me, outside of the village area. Inside of the village, the municipal code does not allow for anybody to ride on the sidewalk, whether it's a um, skateboard, e-bike, um, or a regular bicycle. Correct. Outside of the village area, which the if you look into the municipal code, it does define kind of the general geographic area surrounding the village as well. Okay. Um, say up on 41st, as long as um, it's a kid under 10 years old and they are going with traffic on the sidewalk, that is allowed, like in the in the proper direction. And just, um, sorry, last two questions. Just can you highlight the program that you're working on right now with the helmet program, and then probably the downside of what your guys' is code enforcement and uh, educating, and then to a certain level when does somebody get a ticket? I'm sorry, what was the last part when there's something? Like when would somebody get a ticket? For okay, sure. Using, yeah, but the, and let's be positive first and talk about the helmets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the police department is doing a lot of positive outreach with the community. Um, we've really tried to step up our social media outreach. Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard of the three E's when it comes to traffic safety, being education, enforcement, and um, engineering. So I kind of uh, focus on two of those. Um, education, obviously, we have been working a lot with New Brighton Middle School. Um, we actually have an upcoming event this Saturday at their Harvest Festival uh, where we will be um, donating uh, helmets and uh, lights uh, to kids that are in need. Um, so look out for that. We, we do uh, want to work with the, the school on that because that has been a topic of concern. We've also had more education up there with a school assembly that myself and other officers have, have done recently where we go over some of the rules um, of the road for e-bikes. So that's something we want to focus on. And even though it sounds like Theoretically, uh, nobody under 18 should be on B-cycle bikes. That's, that's something that we want to make sure that the community is aware of what they can and can't do with this. Um, and then the second part, as far as enforcement, we typically like to start with education, even if I'm pulling somebody over. Um, you know, depending on the type of violation and if that person's um, committed that same violation previously, um, because there are times where I've, I've stopped that kid for the second or third time. And, you know, that first one may have just been a brief conversation and they understand, but if it's a second or third time, it may involve uh, their school being contacted or a parent being contacted, potentially a citation, if it's a serious violation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I have one more quick question. So can you walk a bike down the sidewalk in the village? Yes, you can. see a lot of kids walking their bikes. Yeah, and, that, and that's what we would sidewalk. recommend to students, right, if they're down there um, on e-bikes, is walking them would be preferred. There are also municipal code and vehicle code rules regarding leaving bikes to where they're going to block the sidewalk or businesses. Um, and obviously that could get tricky when you have a lot of kids down there, but we would prefer that. Yes, they're following the rules when they're walking the bike on the sidewalk. That's fine. Thank you. Absolutely. A question on this on 18 there. Yep. That lower left-hand picture is supposed to be there. I couldn't find that view anywhere at that site. 
Oh, that, that's a representation of what delineators look like. So that, <laughs> so. that is uh, generic, just info. So nothing, nothing to do with the site specifically, but it would, I couldn't find it. So, <laughs> I walked around, where the heck is he looking? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to wrap up there. Um, and um, so again, we're, we are recommending, we'd love to walk out of here with, with approvals. Um, certainly if um, input from the public or the commission necessitates that we uh, do some additional research, we can do that. Uh, but the goal is we'd like to get as many sites tonight approved so we can uh, get B-Cycle some runway for their installations and planning. Uh, I just want to recap the notes that I have that we can incorporate into uh, the program. One is to minimize loss of parking. Uh, and I'll point out condition number three uh, that we have added. It was in the staff report that Public Works is supposed to sign off on sites before they actually do the drilling and install. So uh, that kind of goes hand in hand there. Uh, for site number 12, we wanted to pull back uh, from the corner. That's the one at San Jose and Esplanade. Uh, we will try to help B-Cycle get in touch with Quality Market as well as the Knowles property. Uh, and then we will double check the clearance by the shower at site 13 Esplanade Park. So I don't think we need to, based on what Kalish said about the, the, the AB 413, in the, in the crosswalk, I think that probably answers the Capitola Knowles question, so I wouldn't insist on that. So that's my oh, conclusion. Yeah. Thank you. So the way, the way I understand this, when we make a motion to improve, approve this, um, and do we need to include some language that says there's flexibility for the number of bike docking stations to change within the site based on use um that would be preferred yes okay and that if there are any new sites added those sites will come back to the planning commission yes and if if you wanted to i think you could in your motion say something that w as long as the site is within a block if you want to make it more broad um knowing just the example of across from gales and if the roundabout were to go in that it wouldn't have to necessarily come back to planning commission so it's just how flexible you would like to be with it but well it seems like when the roundabout gets approved that would be incorporated something in that, yeah Anyway, but yeah, to give some flexibility to the number of docks would be great. So is someone, do we want more discussion or is someone interested? I think it's worth a comment or two. Just just saying that I think this is a great idea. I really appreciate B-Cycle going through the effort and, and bringing this great opportunity to our village. And I, and I don't have any, uh, I thought he selected a great number of sites. I kept, you know had a great tour of the village <laughs> and my city and, and I said and I thought they were just wonderful sites for the most part and uh, I highly I, I hope uh, for a lot of success in this okay with all of that would you also like to make a motion to I, <laughs> no because I'm not sure your amendments okay so uh, the amendments I was suggesting was that we include language that allows them to uh, change the number of docking stations within the approved sites um, based on how they're being used. And if any additional sites are added, that would come back to the Planning Commission uh, unless uh, and for relocations of sites, they could be done by staff if they were within uh, the same block. So I move staff recommendation with the chair's amendments, as stated. Okay. A second. We have a motion and a second. Do we want to do a roll call vote? Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Jensen? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Vice Chair Christensen? Aye. And Chair Westman? Aye. 
Okay, looks like we have a bike program that's going to get started in the spring. I was wondering, um, would we be able to respond to the comment from the um, public with how the success of the program is going right now? I think sure. the, the question, if you guys give us a highlight. Yeah, um, I'm actually really happy to note some of these things. Um, either this week or last week, we hit a quarter of a million trips. We've only been launched since June 20th. Um, right now, we're averaging between about 11,000 to 17,000 trips a week. Um, when I had Jump Bikes at its peak, when we, have about, when we had about 600 bikes, we were doing about 11,000 trips a week, and we had about 200 less. Um, so to me, this has been a huge success just as an entire program. Uh, I think it also proves that dock-based bike share is probably the better of the options out there. A lot less problems. Um, something I hear from the city of Santa Cruz very regularly is the lack of negative calls and feedback they receive. It's maybe one call a month now versus a couple a day when we had jump bikes. Um, so generally, I mean, it's just been very successful. Um, we do still have vandalism and stuff like that, which we dealt with with jump. Um, so a little bit ahead of that this time, just with my previous experience. Um, but generally, it's been very, very successful. Um, Trek as a company is very happy with the success as well. So I think, uh, I mean, it's full steam ahead. Just keep growing the program. I mean, personally speaking to me, this is a huge accomplishment in my own personal life. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for it. I mean, building a regional bike share program, I mean, I don't know the exact statistic here, but nationally, there aren't many of them. If any others really this size. So this is a new pretty big adventure for our own company and I think ourselves in this area, our county. Um, yeah, so I think just generally it's been very successful. I think the, the future looks pretty bright. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now we will move on to our director's report. Oh, thank you all for being here, all the staff as well as the public on this issue. Okay, good evening. Um, tonight I wanted to provide you with a couple of updates. First, uh, at the last city council meeting, the rail trail was considered. The, the county had asked for consideration for a consolidated CDP, as well as uh, whether the other question we asked the council is, would the council like to submit any comments on the EIR? The outcome of that meeting was the council did have comments to provide on the EIR, so I'm drafting those in summary and we'll be sending those to the county during the 60-day review period. Um, and second, um, regarding the consolidated permit, the city council, I think at the beginning of the meeting, it looked like they were headed towards definitely review it at the local level by the end of the meeting they decided to go with the consolidated permit. I believe the reason for that um, was to make it a really clear process for the, for the different um, parties involved in this. There's a lot of different people that showed up that night with different opinions, and to just have them all be heard by the Coastal Commission and under one review rather than separate coastal development permits by the City of Capitola and the county and then most likely those will get appealed to the Coastal Commission anyway because of the differing opinions. So essentially that was the outcome of that meeting. Um, and then the other update I wanted to give you is that next Thursday we're bringing the final draft of the housing element to, well, hopefully the final draft of the housing element to the City Council. Um, we, you had asked that I bring back updates on uh, where this is headed. So I've got some updates for you tonight. The updated draft will be published tomorrow on the website. All of your edits that were approved at our last hearing on the 19th are incorporated in green, so it's really easy to identify. We still have all the color, co color coordination in there. Um, but for missing middle, that was one of the items that we had to solve. Um, we came up with the 200 units that the HCD wanted. Um, actually, our ADU count for this year, we're at, we've issued 10 building permits and we have three in the process that will likely be approved by the end of the year. So now this is the first time that we've 
issued 13 in one year. So the track is going higher. Because the missing middle numbers aren't tied to the RENA calculation, uh, HC will give us a little more flexibility in where we come up with our numbers. So we're, we've put um, a dedication of that, a, a projection of 100 ADUs in the next eight years. We also increased our number of projections for SB9. We've actually had two applications come in for SB9. Um, so we're not projecting beyond that, but consistent with the two. And then also for the duplexes on corner lots, I think that got bumped about 10 units to make it all come together. Um, so that happened. Also, uh, another update is the there were comments from the HCD about the mall, and there's a con we've said that in 2027, if we don't have an application from the mall, we will again reassess the situation at the mall and see if um, there's any other alternatives we can implement. Um, you'll see that some of the numbers with the, within the arena categories have just changed within the very low, low, and moderate. So just um, based on some of the decisions that have been made, on congregational sites and these little changes, you're gonna see a little bit of change, um, but we still have a nice healthy buffer in there. And then the deadline to deliverables, um, got this great sweat, uh, spreadsheet now. I worked with Veronica Tam on exactly what the state is gonna require to be done by 2024. And those items are all called out. And that, that's basically anything that we're not in align, we're not in alignment with state law. So um, our density bonus law is out of date. We'll be, we've got to update that in 2024. Um, the allowance of allowing shelters in areas that are not just industrial, so that'll be an update. And those are just two examples, but um, otherwise you're gonna see a lot of areas in green that I'm really trying to keep the, um, the updates to our code to be due by the end of 2025, so that gives us enough time to get certified by the Coastal Commission. And then anything that requires funding and projects to kind of happen between uh, 20, yeah, 2025 and 2026, so that it's a little more realistic in what we're doing as staff and getting these out. And a lot of the, um, of the I think there's 79 items that are called out for action. Um, some of them are, we already do, such as, um, some of the assistance for emergency rental assistance if someone's about to get kicked out of their apartment will fund three months of assistance. So there, there are programs that are listed in there, but they're just ongoing and continuing. So um, I also wanted to let you know that in terms of uh, Commissioner Estes' comments on the water and the, the um, addendum to the EIR, there was definitely an error in that section so thank you for your work on that and um, you'll there's red lines that are going into the draft DIR to fix that issue so um, and also to provide more clarity about the so our water sources and those studies that are done on a regular basis by the water districts so um, appreciate all your hard work on the housing element update and your comments and if you notice anything is missing, please reach out because we can incorporate it at the city council meeting if, if there are any errors. So, um, and that concludes my director's report this evening. Thank you. So we, so you, so we did have a water uh, comment in the EIR that said the water will be affected. So it wasn't. A it was. It was more about um, the numbers that were tied. To, they were referencing numbers that were incorrect from the water study. So they've, they've updated that, and they've also updated some more information on, like, the water sources and the studies that are done regularly at the right, water a, district. Did, there was a separate study that the EIR referenced, but the, the reference in the EIR was the number was different than what was in the study. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. So they had to, you just got to get, make them jive. Are there any updates, any future projects that we'll be seeing in the near future? Oh, you know, I have an update on uh, 1098 38th. We're taking a funding request to the city council for $250,000 next week. So with some affordable housing money. Um, and Brian received the application on that this past week, the preliminary application. I don't think they've paid their fees yet, but that, that'll be right around the corner. So that something you'll see in the new year. And um, 
The assisted living facility on Capitola Road, on the corner of Capitola Road and Bulb, that project is resurfacing. So I, um, one owner has sold their portion of the partnership, and he, one owner has a new partner that will be moving forward with, again, an assisted living project. So they've been asking to meet with staff. Um, and then there's uh, one project up on Depot Hill that will be coming to you soon. It's the El Salto project next to the property next to the Monarch Cove Inn. Um, and there, there's a fourplex on the site right now and also a single family home. They're hoping to uh, demolish the fourplex and build two duplexes, I believe. So is um, that correct? And a new, and a new single family and no map. So that, that's where that one's headed. But so you'll see all those in the either, yeah, you'll see them in the new year. I think at this point. So. Thank you. You're welcome. She working. 